Welcome to the Traveling Professors. I'm Professor Bob. And I'm Professor Sherry. And together we are the the Traveling Traveling Professors. Professors. Today's show, number 45, is a walking tour as well as the history of the Colosseum in Rome. Now, I had intended to do the Colosseums in Arles and Nîmes, but since they're smaller versions of the Colosseum in Rome, it's easier to go to Rome and take a nice tour. We have toured the whole Colosseum, so we hope you enjoy this. In 2016, Sherry and I went to Italy for 23 days, spent a week in Rome and a few days in Naples, a week in Florence, and then of course we were also in Venice. And when we were in Rome, we stayed at an apartment building across from the Colosseum. So here is a picture of the Colosseum as we're walking out of our metro stop. Now this at one time was supposed to be part of this gigantic palace that Nero was building, but when he was overthrown, the whole area was then repurposed. And so the Colosseum was begun by the Emperor Vespasian, which is the emperor after Nero, and he began construction in 72 AD. It was finished under his son Titus in 80 AD. And when it opened, it had 100 days of festivals, gladiating, animal hunting, and all sorts of different things. Now, in this aerial picture, you see what it looked like on one side when it was finished, and the other side, what it looks like today. Gladiating and other events in what is known not as the Colosseum, it's really known as Amphitherium Flavium, or the Flavian Amphitheater. The idea of the name Colosseum didn't come about until the Middle Ages, and that was based upon this 80-foot giant bronze statue, supposedly of Nero. It may very well have been um, Hercules. The last gladiatorial games were held here in 523 by the Ostrogothic king Theodoric. But after that, it was basically abandoned and used as a source for for stone. Uh, There was a story, however, that kind of kept it from being completely destroyed. In the Middle Ages, an Anglo-Saxon monk named Bede claimed that Rome will stand as long as the Colosseum stands. If the Colosseum falls, Rome will fall. And if Rome perishes, the world will end. So they left it alone at that point. A noble Roman family in the, in the city, the Fragapani, took responsibility of turning it into a fortress. Now, I know everybody says, well, the only reason it's there is because the popes blessed it as a site for the commemoration of martyrs. Well, that's true, but that does not happen until 1744 when a bronze cross was erected in the arena. And at that point, they they begin restoring it. Well, let's get all the dimensions and all of that out of the way before we take our tour. As you can see here, it holds 50,000 spectators. Now, you'll find people that will say it holds 60, it holds 70,000, but it does not hold anything more than 70,000. Most people agree that it's probably 50 or 60. You'll see how high it is, 158 feet, it's 48 meters, 620 feet, or 189 meters at its widest point. Now, it's an ellipse, so it's a, it's a little bit, its longest end is this, 620. The traverse access is 156 meters or 512 feet. And only today two-thirds of the actual building survives. 3.5 million cubic feet of stone and of that 100,000 cubic meters of travertine marble which would have been on the outside and some of the inside sections. There are four entrances for the upper classes. There's a special entrance for the emperor. Then you have 80 regular entrances for everybody else. And you have a ticket. It's free entrance. Each ticket has a number on it. It tells you which one of these spaces that you go into. And then you go up to whatever level you're supposed to be. Now, the first level is where you find the columns. They're half columns, demi-columns. Now, those are Doric, and that's the patrician area. And then you go up to the next section, the second level, which is Ionic columns. And that's where the Akites or the Knights are. And you see that they have the third level, which is Corinthian in style. Those are mixed classes. The top level, which is, has a wooden set of stands, that's generally for the women at this point. But there's 240 arches that go away all the way around this. And on the fourth level, you have 40 windows, 40 shields. And then up above that, you see all these masts. 235 masts, and that's where the awning goes. 
Here's an example of the Colosseum with its awning, its vellum. I believe that uh, the Gladiator movie with Russell Crowe has a really good representation of what it looked like with the awning over the top of it. Of course, it gave plenty of light to the people down there fighting. And then here's a close-up of the sections of how the awning was put into place. It's also called, as you see, a valerium. And it was hauled into position by teams of sailors from the Imperial Naval Base near Mycenaeum. A capstan where they lift everything. They have gaps between the Colosseum and the awning. I guess you could call this the world's largest Roman shade. And so you have supporting ropes. It's all quite complicated. But you will find these on some of the other uh, arenas as well. The, the one at Arles and the one at Nîmes also had a covering over it at some time. Here's a nice cutaway view of the Colosseum. And you can see the different levels. First level, second level, third level, and fourth level. And I'm sure that senatorial women were allowed to sit in those particular areas, patrician class. The way they get in, you, you come in, and you'll see this when we go walking through it, but they call it the vomitoria, and it's these runways that go up so you can quickly fill the stands, and you can quickly empty the place with all of the different 80 different openings that there are. And of course, you see the uh, nice awning piece up here. Then you see the view down below on the, on the surface. Uh, the gate of life, where the gladiators come in, and the gate of death, where those that are dead go out. And, of course, the Emperor's box as well. And then they show the area down below where you have all sorts of storage. This is where they keep the props, where they keep the animals, where they keep the slaves, the military equipment. Then here's a closer look of the, the floor scape. Now, today, you can, at this point, you can go partially out. They have partially reconstructed the uh, floor and you can get a nice view down below of all of the different storage areas. Now, of course, when, when Sherry and I were there, you couldn't walk through here. It, they've just now allowed people to wander through here. I want you to notice one other thing. All these different trap doors that can come up to bring uh, animals, soldiers, all sorts of props, you name it. We're going to look at some examples of types of contests. Now, in this one, again, you get a nice cutaway view of all the different sections, but look down on the... the uh, the floor. They've turned it into kind of a forest, and you would have animals running through there. They would do battles. They'd do all sorts of different things. And of course, all that material is then brought up from down below. And then here's an example where you have gladiators. And you've got gladiators out on top of the stage area, and the animals are coming up, and they're coming up from the middle of the arena. But these areas in the back where you see the grates, they can come out of there as well. A controversial version is there's always a discussion that sometimes this was used for little mock naval battles. And it may have at one time, but you can see how the floor is. That's a wooden floor with sand over the top of it, usually about three feet worth of sand, and with all these trap doors. And I don't know how you would get that water tight, but they probably had some method of doing it. And they would be smaller sized ships. They usually did these at a lake outside of Rome. One of the problems you have with these, there's so many people involved in them, the concern that instead of fighting each other, they're just going to pull the ship over and jump into the crowd meant that you had to have a large number of troops there in order to uh, stop that. So it is a little bit controversial whether or not this really took place at the Colosseum. Well, it's time to actually get started with our walking tour. Here's a nice aerial view of the Colosseum. And here is the building where we stayed. This is an apartment complex with restaurants on the lower floors. Here's a nice closer view of it. There were two apartment groups with similar names. And originally, I planned to stay in one that was on the top floor so that you could have a nice view of the whole area. But when we arrived, I realized that I'd picked the other one, which was down on the ground floor. So we didn't get a nice aerial shot. But every morning we had breakfast out here in front. It was about $200 a night to stay here. But the metro was half a block away. And we went everywhere, either walking or on the metro. And you talk about fun, taking a night walk around the Colosseum and down the street to the Circus Maximus. Worth its weight in gold. So here's the entry area. We went up the steps to the door where we have the apartment location. And we come in and there is the, the desk where the proprietor is there. Now we, uh, here's the interior of the, the room, the nice bed, queen size bed. It's a little snug, but again, location, location, location. There's the uh, the desk where I operated with the computer. A beautiful bathroom, beautiful shower. 
And then, of course, if you chose to eat in the restaurants, this would be the view that you would have looking out at the Coliseum. Now, we ate breakfast there. We actually found around the corner and down a half a block a really good Italian restaurant. Rick Steve recommended it, and we ate there. So that's where we stayed, where we headquartered for our trip to Rome. And whenever we were ready to leave, they provided us with a vehicle to take us to the train station. The real problem with visiting the Colosseum is if you want the tour. And at the time we were there, the tour would take you to the under area down below the surface. You couldn't go down there on your own. As a matter of fact, the only places that you could go on your own were the first two levels. And this tour also included taking you all the way up to the top. What I didn't know, it also took us out onto the surface of the recreated gladiatorial stadium floor. It was, it was about a third of it at that time. But in order to get that ticket, they only sold so many of them. And they put them in. You had to go to the computer every day, every, every check when they were coming up, so that you could pick what you wanted. That's why we spent a week in Rome. Not that we could not spend less time there, but I had a lot of time so that whatever the ticket was, we could make it. We had two tickets like that. One was to go to Rome, and the other one was to see Leonardo da Vinci's The Last Supper. And once I had both of those tickets, then I made the final arrangements for how long we were going to stay. So anyway, after, after breakfast, we walked over, and you can see the line forming. Now we had, um, I think it was 11 o'clock in the morning is when we were supposed to go. We had bought a Rome Pass. If you go to Rome, if you go to Venice, if you go to Florence, buy their city pass. It covers all the museums, entrances, and you can just walk by all these people. Now, because we had a special ticket, had special reservations, they have people at the back of the line saying, you go here. And it's, it's just amazing to save two hours walking by all the people standing in line. And then you would end up getting your ticket after from and then we would stand in line again so here we are heading to our they only do four of these tours like every half hour or 45 minutes so we're now going down through the area now these are the you can see when i was talking about how they move people how cleverly devised system that the romans built these vaulted passages running all the way around the building with flights of steps and ramps radiating from them which make quick access really easy to any level but of course, those 80 gates aren't open. They're all graded. So once you get in here now, there's only one way in and one way out. So I always stay ahead of everybody to get clean pictures. Ultimately, we had a little spot where we waited, had a number on it. And then our tour guide, who was a art historian from the University of Rome, came and then gave us our tour. And so then she's talking about the vaulted ceilings and, you know, where you see the, the holes in the wall, that's where they would have put slabs of travertine. So we're going heading around and then we come to this corner where you actually, you could go outside. <laughs> they, have a, they have it covered in a gate with a lock on it, but they do night tours. I know my daughter and her husband, when they were in Rome, took a night tour of the underground of the Colosseum. And that was really, really special. So then we head to this flight of stairs, and then we're going out onto the arena floor. As we start up the stairs, as we reach the top, I realize we are going out on the arena floor. I was not prepared for that. I just was so excited I practically ran out there. But I composed myself. Didn't want to embarrass my wife. So we start heading down this runway, and as you come towards the end of it, you can see the opening at the other side of the arena. That is the Gate of Life. We are actually coming onto the arena floor in what is known as the Gate of Death, where they drag all the dead gladiators out. The first thing I did, because as you can see, I'm in, I'm in front of everybody, so that I don't have to worry about people in my picture. The first thing I did is then snap a series of pictures from right to left. So this is the right-hand side. There's the next shot. There's where the emperor's area is located. And now we're di looking directly across. This is the gate of life where all the gladiators would come out. And there's a closer shot of it. I would point out that the gladiators, when they were heading that way, they went down in the bottom, down below the floor. They then come across. They are then given their weapons. They've got their armor on, but they're given their weapons at this point. And then they come out and go before the emperor or whoever is paying for the games and do the we who are about to die salute you thing. Then after it's over, the winners go back out this way, turn in their weapons. That's a result of the Spartacus Revolution. After the Spartacus Revolt, it was illegal to have gladiators with real weapons until it was time to perform. 
And then here is the other side of the stadium. This would have all had stone steps, stone seats, and then we come around at the opposite end. And then I turned around and you can see, <laughs> here comes the rest of the crowd. And Sherry took this picture. Uh, that's me giving the thumbs down s signal. The thing about that is, it's the way we find it in movies. Giving the crowd the ability to grant life or death did happen in the arenas. But the thumbs up, thumbs down thing may or may not be correct. For example, there's a discussion about the hand as holding a dagger. So if you're going to give the signal of life, you want the dagger blade up. If you want to kill the person, you have to turn the dagger blade down. Now, what happens is, wherever your thumb is, the thumb is at the back of the dagger to give it more force when you stab someone. So if you want to give them life and you got your thumb up, you've got to turn it the opposite direction. And that means you're turning the blade up to give them life. So what I'm actually doing at this particular point is signaling life. You can also wave handkerchiefs and scream and whatever else. But I would point out to you, try it yourself. Stick your arm out. Put your thumb up. It seems very easy. It's real easy to stab up and down if that's a dagger. But if you want to give life, just feel the turn in your shoulder when you're doing it the other direction. So it's a lot harder to give life than it is to kill them. Then off to one side, they have a partially restored section where you have the seats where the people would have sat. The interior of the Coliseum. And as far as I'm concerned, I, they could say we're done for the day. That was so spectacular to do. Now, I'm not wild about the fact that they're going to cover this completely over. And you'll be able to walk the whole thing. Uh, there is some discussion that the Italians have plans to do some special things with the stadium floor. Probably doing projections and other things. But I think this is a really nice setup the way it is. Well, while we're up here on the stadium floor, let's use this as an opportunity to take some good pictures of the underground area because it's really easier to, to view and grasp all of the different areas from above than it is down below. So here's the right straight down the middle. Now they have it open at this point so you can walk through here. I don't know whether they have it so that there's limited areas that you can go, but I know that they have put a floor right down the center of this so that you can walk straight through the middle. But the, the view looking down is, is pretty nice. Now here's the to the side. If you look at the area where you would have the see the people sitting up above here. And then you could have animals and people and, for, and, and all sorts of props brought up from down below. And then here is a artist rendition of what that would look like. They have all kinds of pulleys and, and levers. And, and they've restored some of the actual mechanisms down below. And then again, as I did... Looking at the upper part, I shot it from one section to the other. So from the right edge, here's the view. You can see how it circles around. Now this lower area is much smaller. Uh, it's uh, 256 by 151 feet at its longest, or 78 meters by 46 meters. And there are about 30 underground niches that are in this area as well. We've already seen the, the middle. So here's the next section going off to the left. And then we get to the other side of the of the arena floor. And then it's time to leave the arena floor. And now we're going to the basement. We're going down on ground level with that underground section. It was so dark shooting directly in when we got the, the entrance to the underground area. I turned around and took this shot so you could get an idea of the architecture. And then turning around, here we are shooting as we're heading towards that central region. And we come around the little corner. And then that takes us down where you see where they would have had water coming in. Still has water coming in. And then here is one of the areas where they had a device that uh, you could turn the mechanism. It was a mechanism that changed some of the uh, gates and all sorts of stuff. And we'll get a closer shot of that later on. And here is the central section. This is as far as you could go. They've got a fence up that I can shoot over. But uh, you couldn't go any further here. They didn't want people getting lost in here. But as I said before, they've put a little platform in here so you can walk down the middle. It's, it's, it's really nice to view. I don't know what it would be like if this was completely covered over and all you had was lighting. That would make it more realistic than what it was like when the people were working down here. And then here is the picture of the up above, the flooring that's holding the amphitheater floor that's available today in place. 
And then here's the close-up of the mechanism I was talking about. And they would use that to open gates, to bring up the animals, to bring up props. There were all sorts of these all over the floor. And it's my understanding that they have indeed repaired a great number of these. And then here's one of the niches around one side. And then there is, a, once again, the view out into that central region. And then we'd have to turn around and we have to leave. But we're not done on our tour. We're going to go all the way up to the top of the building next. But this is a view coming back and see the vaulted ceilings and all the rock work. And then here's the steps leading up to our next level. Now we're going to climb all the way up to a viewing area on the fourth level. So we started up here with the steps. They do have an elevator for those who, who need it. And then we'll go down various halls and continue climbing up. We didn't stop at the second or third level because that's something that we could do after we had seen the full tour. So periodically we'd sneak out and take a quick picture. So here's a we're about on the third level at this point, shooting out onto the uh, where the where the arena floor is located. And then here's a shot of one of the circles, the people on the third level. And of course you would have had stone seating up there. And then there's a shot of the with the with the long distance lens of that that wonderful part of the amphitheater. And then here we are drawn back. We're not quite dead center where the gate of life is, but you can see how vast this thing is. Now what they've done at this point is they've done this. They've added a walkway down through the middle, which does allow you to give you some nice shots of the flooring and the holding areas from above. But I like that being able to see that whole corridor down the middle. I think this detracts from the overall view, but that's just my personal opinion. And then we finally get up to the fourth level. And you can see everything has changed from the, the way it's viewed. And it, a, th a thunderstorm came up. So we got a few pictures and then we had a stop. But this is one section. They have a little, little area where you can go. It would have had wooden stands up here. And then this is a shot out of the, out of the grate down on the floor from this nosebleed section. So if you've got two gladiators down there fighting it to the death, you were, they better have a good costume on so you can see what, what they're like. Now going down is, a, is a, little, a little hairy in some places. But, you know, as I said before, you know, it's easy to get in, it's easy to get out. Now they do night tours at the Coliseum, but we didn't do that. But, so we took our own night tour. We walked all the way around it one evening. So after dinner, we walked across the street to the Coliseum and we took a shot of it from... The, uh, one of the Arches of Triumph here, and then just went all the way around. Now they've got some nice viewing spots on it, and you can see how well it is lit up, and you can, you can get a good steady picture of the Colosseum. You can see that about three quarters of it has already been reinforced and is in pretty good condition. And then you come around here and you can see where the one whole wall section is gone. You see the one piece of it that sticks out. That would have been another whole area of circle around there. And they're reinforcing that. And then the Colosseum all on the other side of that, to about halfway around, is all under scaffolding. At least it was when we were there. That's, that's probably all taken care of. And so we went around, took some more pictures... Got a nice shot of the moon up above, and then we walked back, and this is the view we had from the entrance to our apartment building. Really beautiful. Then one night we walked to the Circus Maximus, and another night we walked up to one of the other baths regions, baths and palace regions. That wasn't very far away. So it was very safe. Excellent location. Well, after taking the tour, you probably want to build your own Colosseum, which you can do. Lego has produced a Colosseum. Here's the box, and here is it fully constructed. Is it mine? No, it's not. I wouldn't mind having that. But $596, I think, is what it costs. That's even too much for me. You can see, looking at the model, that the last circle of, of the uh, Colosseum is, you know, there's only about a third of it there. But you know, you can also get a model that's cheaper. And there's one from National Geographic, which is, it's cardboard. It punches out and punches in. It doesn't require anything. Just follow the instructions. I'm not completely done. But what I like about it is you have one section that you can remove. So you can see all of the different levels as you're going along. And then I'm probably going to use that in a show on a gladiator game that I have. So anyway, I know Sherry and I really loved Rome. And we really loved the Colosseum. And we really liked our location. And we hope you enjoyed the trip through and the walking tour of the Colosseum.
Jerry and I hope you enjoyed the tour. Please come by our YouTube channel at Bob Packett, and please subscribe and leave some comments. Thank you very much. I've been doing podcasting on history for over 15 years. I've got over 4,000 shows, and I've done CDs, which, of course, can be sent out as USBs. So if you would really like to get more on history for free, then come by my website, as you see here, historyaccordingtobob.com, and see what's there. So thank you very much again.